Great. Well, it's good to be back here, really. I, I love this place. It's just so good. Uh, it's exactly the kind of venue and exactly the kind of congregation that really touches my heart. And I know when Paul told me that there was a chance that you'd be getting the building in the university, I just thought, oh, this is amazing. That's really what I've been praying for and longing for. And we're going to talk about missionaries in the city, but I'm going to say a little bit about you know, just opportunities you get in an environment like this. Um, a lot of my ministry when I was Paul's age, and possibly even a bit younger, was, uh, was in the student world. Um, I'd finished at university myself, and almost immediately I started getting invitations to speak. And uh, over quite a number of years, I found myself speaking at universities from Oxford down to uh, Southampton, down into Kent. And most weekends, you know, in the autumn, when students would all disappear off for a weekend away, I would be on those weekends and had the privilege of doing missions in quite a lot of the universities as well. Very often week-long missions with a team. And it was just such a privilege to do that. But occasionally I'd hit a problem, and that is that very often I'd discover that the Christians in the university who'd invited you to speak didn't have any non-Christian friends. It was really quite a problem. They'd been living sort of little like Christian clusters, almost sort of scared to reach out into the world beyond. And, uh, you know, it's quite difficult sometimes to get those kind of breakthroughs. So occasionally I'd find myself sort of, you know, speaking in the bar or something like that. Um, and just having to take what was thrown at me. And it normally was comments, not uh, anything <laughs> physical. But uh, you know, one of the things that, that really got me at that point was that you know, occasionally you get really super clever students. And uh, I used to feel a bit intimidated. I'd, I'd, you know, I'd, I'd pick up degrees as I go along the way. But I must admit that uh, some of the students used to intimidate me. And I, I thought, you know, I must find out how to answer some of these really clever questions. And it wasn't until I was actually doing a doctorate that I discovered it's just a way of asking the questions. There's nothing really clever about it. It's just the language that's used. And, and that was a huge relief to me, actually, <laughs> because it actually gave me a confidence to, to reach out into areas where I'd been a little bit nervous. And I think if we're going to be missionaries in the city, one of the things that we've really got to do is have confidence in our hearts. Confidence that actually what we say will make a difference. Confidence that we can be relevant. And I know it's intimidating. And I think about some of the places where it is intimidating. I used to feel intimidated in the student union building sometimes when I was standing up to speak. But I know that in the world we live today, it's intimidating. There are so many different views, you know? I, believe it or not, when I was a student, which was a, a long time ago, first time around, I've been a student a few times, but a long time ago when I was a student for the first time, the, this country was very different. We were very white, <laughs> we were very, um, well, middle class a lot, really. <laughs> Certainly, you know, it wasn't all like that, but you know, that's where the church was at a lot of the time. And then on top of that, it was very much the thing to do, to go to church. And, and one of the hardest things that we found as students, we'd go up and start talking to our fellow students and say, you know, have you ever thought about becoming a Christian? They're already a Christian. And the assumption was, being born in a Christian country made you a Christian. Or going to church made you a Christian. And it really was a big challenge. So we started to pray. And we had two particular prayers when we were students. I remember prayer meetings where we prayed this. We prayed, God, take the nominalism out of the church. In other words, we want people that really know Jesus in the church. So let's get to the point where we haven't got people who just think they're believers just because they're living in a Christian country or something like that. And then the other thing that we prayed was, God, you know, all these missionaries that have to go to different parts of the world to reach people. And very often it's difficult if you're the only person there trying to reach a whole community. Why don't you send those communities over here so that the church will have an opportunity to reach them on the doorstep? Now, I've mentioned a few times when I've been in church leaders' meetings that those were the two prayers we prayed as students. And one or two church leaders have looked at me and said, so it was all your fault, was it? <laughs> so that's why the nominalism went out of the church. That's why we've been inundated with people from different faiths and different parts of the world. You were praying that they'd come here to get saved. <laughs> and that's exactly what we were praying but you know, somewhere along the line, the church has lost its confidence. 
it actually lives in fear very often, thinking that somehow the light of the church could be easily extinguished by the darkness around us. But that's just not true, is it? In, in John's Gospel, it says the light shines in the darkness and the darkness does not overcome it. Now, that's my first step to gaining confidence, that I know that what we have is greater, another scripture verse, what we have within us is greater than what's in the world. Isn't that amazing? And there are other things that encourage me too. I once gave a, a book to a prisoner, and afterwards, the Bible, gave him the Bible, and I said, here's your Bible. And then the next time I met this prisoner, I said, what did you read first? He said, I read the last two pages. I said, why did you start with the last two pages? He said, you've obviously never been in prison. I thought, that is true. He said, every book in the library, once someone's read you know, these thrillers and find out how, who did it, they rip out the last two pages so that no one else ever finds out who did it. He said, it's the most frustrating thing. Every book you read has got the last two pages missing. So he decided that when I read the Bible, I'm going to read the last two pages first. <laughs> but he said, that was amazing because I discovered what the final picture is. And the final picture is not a picture of the defeat of the church. It's a picture of the victorious church. A glorious church. A church that's like a city that is like no other city. It's called, it's called the New Jerusalem, but the New Jerusalem is nothing like the Old Jerusalem. The New Jerusalem's got a river that flows through it that's called the River of Life. The New Jerusalem has got trees on either side of that river that are the trees of life. It's got walls that are strong, so strong in fact that the gates can always be open. It's a place where there's no darkness because the light's always shining. And that's the final picture. That's where we're heading. And when you realize that, that should fill you with joy and, and excitement. It makes you think, do you know, it's not always going to be tough. But right now, it can be tough. And when we go out as missionaries into the world, we sometimes think, this is just an impossible task. So I started looking. Well, you realize that Jesus was growing up as a Jew in a Jewish community. And there was one area that was the real challenge. And it crops up various times in the Bible. You've all heard the story of the Good Samaritan. Why that is such an amazing story is because there was really huge animosity between the Jews and the Samaritans. Actually, it was almost unthinkable for a Samaritan to be the person who could even, even touch you know, a Jewish person. Even someone who'd been battered and beaten up on the road would probably initially have thought, no, no, I don't want to be touched by a Samaritan, even though that person was there to rescue them. So the whole deal with the Samaritans were they sort of like the no-go people. In fact, you know, <laughs> at one point, we know this, that there was an enclave, a Jewish enclave, established in the north of the territory. This is where Nazareth and around Galilee, all that area, was actually a, 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 an enclave that was established away from the main center around Jerusalem. And in order to get to that enclave, you had to go through Samaria. <laughs> but most of the Jews would refuse to go <laughs> through Samaria. They'd want to go the long way round. <laughs> They'd even cross the Jordan and go all the way round to come into that northern area without going through Samaria. And so when Jesus went through Samaria, and we read this in John chapter 4, and has a passion to reach the people in that area, it's going into the most difficult territory. You know, there's a challenge, isn't there, about your home area. In fact, Jesus said about, you know, that, that northern enclave where he grew up, he said, a prophet is not without honor except in his own family, in his own community, and yet there's Jesus not backing away from that community, but giving himself into that community. Well, Samaria was probably even tougher than his own community. And yet there he is. He goes into that situation. And what I want to look at with you today is how he got the breakthrough in that situation. Because it just seemed like nothing was going to happen there. And how it happens, and this unfolds in John chapter 4, Jesus goes into that area 
And it's quite amazing what he does. It, he's weary, so he, he, he rests by the well while his disciples go to get some food. And whilst he's by the well, this woman comes along. I don't really think this takes Jesus by surprise. I, I've got a kind of feeling that he probably knew this woman was there. <laughs> And he probably knew the time of day she was likely to turn up at the well. <laughs> and he was prepared to wait at the well while everyone else went off to get food. And sometimes we do have to make sacrifices if we're going to reach out. Sometimes you may have to miss the odd meal. Well done, those of you who were fasting for the first time. You now know what it's like. But sometimes we have to make sacrifices in order to reach people. And so Jesus makes this sacrifice. Everyone else goes off and he's just sitting there at the well. And this woman comes along. And then he does something which is really quite extraordinary. He says, can you give me something to drink? Now, that is unusual because what he's actually done is he's already beginning to put himself in a position of indebtedness. He's not starting off by saying, now, let me tell you who I am. I'm here to give you this and give you that and give you the other. He starts building a relationship. And he's building that relationship almost on a basis of dependency. I'm the one who needs water from you. Which immediately places a value on that woman. Now she's got something that she can give into that situation. Yesterday I was um, asked to uh, be the guest of honour along with the mayor of Camden at the Camden uh, Gospel Music Festival. And uh, I saw this lad there who would got the most incredible Rasta hairdo and, and on top of that, a black guy wearing a black mask, so you thought, my goodness, with hair all over his eyes. And I noticed that no one was talking to him. And yeah, that guy had been there from five o'clock in the morning, he put the staging up. And I started just having a conversation with him. And do you know, I was just so completely taken by surprise when I started this conversation that, that just so much about this person was different from what you'd have thought from the outside appearance. And yet, it's when you start making those kind of contacts and you're prepared to, to, to not go into that conversation with, hey, let me tell you a thing or two, you guy with Rasta hairdo and a mask on. You, know, you don't go in like that. But it led to the most amazing time. I think we spent several hours together as it turned out in the end. But it was just an example of you know, sometimes you, you have to get over that, this isn't my normal comfort zone, and just think, just got to get beyond that. And, and it's because sometimes when you're feeling a little bit unsure in yourself, it could be that there's someone else there who's feeling even more unsure of themselves than you are. <laughs> and we shouldn't always make the assumption that everyone else is out there with all the answers and we're coming along and we don't know what to say and how it's going to work. It isn't like that. And so I've got this amazing sense in my heart that when Jesus starts this conversation, there's something that's going on on the inside of him because when Jesus meets anybody, he's filled with compassion. He cares about people. He meets this woman. He's caring about her from the moment that she arrives. <laughs> For a start, you know, we could ask the question, why is she gathering water in the middle of the day? Any of you have grown up in communities where you have to go gather water, you get it first thing in the morning, don't you? It's a bit cooler then. <laughs> and you go, and it's quite a social event. I mean, there was a time when uh, I remember there was a water shortage in London and we all had to have standpipes. We all had to go and collect the water from the standpipes. It's, it's amazing. This was a long time ago now. And just it was only for a few weeks. But you, you discovered neighbours that you'd never met before, you know. My wife was going along with these big containers and saying to people, morning campers, because it just felt like camping really. But, you know, in those kind of moments, those, those social moments are really important. And yet this woman was deliberately missing out on the social moments. She wasn't going there when everyone else was getting water from the well. She'd waited till everyone else was having their midday siesta and was safely inside. And then she'd go to the well on her own to get the water. And of course Jesus knows these kind of things. He knows why she's sort of wanting to hide away. And yet in his compassion he reaches out to her and says, 
can you give me something to drink? And it's amazing because she, she's looking at Jesus and she doesn't know who he is, but, but why is he talking to me? He's a Jew, he's obviously Jewish, and yet he's talking to me, a Samaritan woman. And Jesus knows the whole situation. I tell you, you know, it's not that dissimilar from today. If you look at the whole area of Samaria, what had happened was, that was originally where the ten northern tribes of Israel lived. But the ten northern tribes that were called Israel, as opposed to the southern two tribes that were called Judah, they would reached a point where their sort of rebellion against God was so great that he allowed the Assyrians to come and take them off. But the way the Assyrians worked, they didn't actually take the whole nation into captivity because they'd already taken other nations into captivity. What they did was they mixed everyone up thinking that if we don't put the same people back in the same land, they'll never get enough strength in order to come against us. So what they do was they take people worshipping different gods with totally different cultural backgrounds and they put them all together in one place and say, now get on with it. And actually, most of the time, they didn't get on with it very well. <laughs> and when everybody first arrived in this whole mix-up in that area that had once been the territory of the ten northern tribes, what was happening was there were so many disasters that they actually, the Assyrians asked the question, isn't there anyone here who knows what the local god really wants? <laughs> And it was a, a real opportunity at that point to say, look, there needs to be some order in this society. But the woman's testimony all those years later when Jesus comes is that they never really found order in that society. It was still a chaotic society where some worship this, some worship that. This woman said, we haven't got a clue what we worship. We, we've lost track of what it's all meant to be about. You know, some worship this stone, some worship there, some worship these golden calves, some worship this, some worship on the high places. We just don't know where we're at anymore. And that can be intimidating, can't it? You think, where do you start when people don't even know who they're worshipping? Where do you start when the world's got into that kind of confusion? And that's our challenge. If we want to be missionaries in today's world, if we want to be missionaries in the city, we're going to cities like Samaria. <laughs> Partly because me and my fellow students prayed the way we did. <laughs> but we always saw it as the church's opportunity. The church's opportunity. If we really let the light shine. There are so many stories about individual missionaries. I've, I've got one at the back, actually. My wife wrote the book that you're welcome to, to get today, but um, that was one woman who went to an area where no one else was there as a missionary and she just gave herself, worked as a midwife, saw people come to the Lord. But just imagine, I, I always think to myself, instead of one one lone midwife, what if there had been a whole hospital of, of, of believers that were, were actually showing people what it means to be Christians by how much we love one another? Because that should be the testimony, shouldn't it? There should be a corporate witness that comes from the church that's even greater than our individual witness. Because when we're on our own, we let our light shine. But when we're together, you know, that increases the light enormously and people can see the way we relate to one another and that's so powerful but here we have Jesus and he's in this place and he's got one person just one person now that also can be a little bit of a challenge because sometimes we think if we're going to reach a city we need to have a big campaign because what's the point of starting with one but actually, the person that you talk to could be the starting point for something so much bigger. I'm still going to pray for this guy I met yesterday. I, I, I tell you, I think, wow, what a testimony that guy is going to have. <laughs> but it's just that thought that you don't have to have a massive crowd. You can just begin with one person.
And that's what Jesus did. So a few things I want to bring out from this. This woman had a story. But it was a story she didn't want to tell. She had a life story that was worthy of a book. But it was probably a book you wouldn't want to read. The fact that she'd had five husbands was just an indication that she was a victim of the divorce laws at the time. All it would take was for someone to renounce her. And she was left as damaged goods from the first husband who said, I no longer want you. She'd have had a label in that community. And then another person comes along and she must have thought, this is amazing, someone wants me. And then that person too says, actually, you are damaged goods, I don't want you. And she didn't just go through that twice, she went through it again and again and again. And she eventually ends up living with this guy and she's so ashamed about her whole life that she's not even prepared to come out and get the water with the other villagers. She'd got a story. She'd got a story of pain and agony. And you know, every one of us has got a story. <laughs> the things that you go through in life, some can be absolutely awful. But actually, they're the potential for a story. Some of us could be racking our brains thinking, what have I gone through that's terribly awful that would make a great story? No, your story will be relevant to someone. You know? You don't have to have, I was once a bank robber. Because you don't meet too many bank robbers who are waiting to hear the bank robber's testimony. You know? I was a bored housewife, might actually have more impact. <laughs> Or I was a frustrated school mum who couldn't cope with the kids. You know, these kind of stories, we think they have no currency, but somehow when God gets into the situation, it changes everything. So here's Jesus talking to someone who was not highly rated. Actually, at first sight, she was the worst person to start an evangelistic campaign because she didn't know anybody. <laughs> she hadn't got relationships with people, she'd been hiding. But people knew she was there. Even though they didn't know who she was, they knew she was there behind those drawn curtains in that secluded household. They knew she was there. But somehow that story needed to turn. And when Jesus came, do you know what Jesus did? He actually told her something that caught her attention. He'd asked her for water. And then he said to her, Do you know, if you knew who I was and what I could give you, you'd be asking me for water. And the water that I could give you would mean that you would never be thirsty again. Now, I don't think that was Jesus, what can I say, standard method of witnessing. Because I think with Jesus, he was always capable of bringing an illustration that was relevant in the situation. Able to turn it around. So that the conversation wasn't apparently going off in a different direction, but you could just sort of take it the next step. And so he says, this is, this is what you could have. And then she starts opening up, doesn't she? And Jesus opens her up as well. And he, he tells, her, tells her what's going on in her life. And you'd have thought that this was going to be such a sort of devastating moment for her. And I know if it had been anyone else other than Jesus, it probably would have been devastating. Because one of the things when you read scripture you need to think about the tone and not just the words. You see, it could have been a case of him saying, you're right when you say you have no husband. The fact is, you've had five husbands and the man you now have is not your husband. What you've just said is quite true. 
Now, she'd have gone away from condemned, wouldn't she, after an encounter like that. But when you realise Jesus says, you're right, when you say you have no husband. Fact is, you've had five husbands. And the man you now live with is not your husband. What you've just said is quite true. And can you just feel the way it would have lifted at that particular point? For the first time in her life with someone who, who actually understood her, who was not condemning her, who was not saying, before we continue this conversation, that did he? Didn't tell her to leave him? I'd rather hope that he was one who said, now I believe too. <laughs> but we don't know. But I want you to see that, that when Jesus started telling her the story, it changed her life. And the way it changed her life is something that really speaks to me about being a missionary in our cities today. Because what we need is lots of little lights. <laughs> and when we light a little light, it can light other lights, can't it? And the change in that woman was that she went from being someone with no confidence and a story that she didn't feel that she could tell to being someone who was filled with confidence. It's possible that some of you here today, when I'm talking, I've actually got some great content. You know, you've already worked out, I've got a great testimony, I remember exactly how Jesus met me and where I was at, and I can tell people about that. But alongside the content, you need the confidence. You need the confidence that comes in knowing exactly how Jesus did meet you. And some of us who've gone on how to evangelize courses, have developed techniques that sometimes lose the tone. We can tell people where they've gone wrong in a way that leaves them feeling wretched. I, I've sat through sermons like that. I remember one particular evangelistic sermon that was preached not very far from here quite a long time ago on a big tent in Blackheath. And, and the preacher had really, you know, sort of banged the gospel home and so he did his appeal at the end and the appeal was in the same tone as the sermon <laughs> but he was determined that at least one person was going to respond to the gospel that night and the pressure was creeping up you know and we were all sitting in our chairs and thinking well I know I already believe but you know perhaps if I went forward I'd put an end to all of this <laughs> and eventually this lady stands up and he says to her, at last, someone who's responding to the gospel call. And she goes, no, I'm not. I'm just going home. <laughs> <laughs> but can you see that it's not just the words that we say. It's the confidence that we have to, to carry the compassion that makes the difference. You know, and this is not salesmanship. You're not trying to close the deal as quickly as possible. You don't close the deal until the person actually knows that you care for them. Because it's caring for people that make the difference in the end. I mean, this woman in the end wanted to be like Jesus, didn't she? And we all want people to be like Jesus. But the first time they meet Jesus, they're meeting him through you, they're meeting him through me. What kind of impression do we leave? You know, the more I think about this story, the more it encourages me. I'm definitely into big evangelistic campaigns. I know that sometimes people get saved in the an an anonymity of a big evangelistic campaign. You know, they've, as Jesus said, you know, we, we reap where others have sown. <laughs> and you never know whether you're at a, a reaping moment or a sowing moment. <laughs> and sometimes they're very separate. You know, the students that, that were around when I first went to university were very patient because I, I, was, I was like a little bit gospel resistant at the beginning. 
And yet they carried on. It was quite a while with seed being sown before there was a harvest. <laughs> and then, you know, the person who actually harvested probably thought, what an amazing job I've done in leading this person to the Lord, not realizing that most of the hard work had been done by all of those people who'd seen no response from me for, for months. <laughs> the people that had sort of got under my skin with the stories that they said. We don't know. But you know, in the midst of what's going on in this world in which we live, and this is why Jesus said, pray for more laborers into the harvest field. Because most people don't get saved on initial contact. We need more people in that harvest field. And the incredible thing is this, I want to lift some of the burden of responsibility off you. Because I feel it's the burden of responsibility that sometimes stops us actually getting there. You know, we've got to seal the deal within two minutes so that we can move on to the next person. But that's, that's not the way Jesus was in this situation. I don't even think the woman prayed the prayer, to be honest. <laughs> but she went away changed, didn't she? Completely different person. Everyone must have been really surprised when she came back into the village and started saying, Hey, everybody, I'm back, you know. Oh, wait. Goodness me. <laughs> so I want, I want you to meet a person who's told me everything I ever did. Now, that's a testimony, isn't it? I, generally speaking, that is not the way that you'd want to go and recommend someone, is it? <laughs> Yeah. I've just met this person who told me everything I'd ever did. I think you should meet him too. And they said, no, thank you. <laughs> but the way that he talked about what she ever did was taking on a journey of release to the point where she was free. And initially people believed because of what she said. But then they had the opportunity to meet Jesus for themselves. Because he stayed on two days, didn't he? He stayed on. And one of my favorite verses is this, that, that Jesus sent his disciples out to where he himself would come. Now that, that gives me hope. Because it means that my little efforts are no longer on their own. I didn't seal the, the deal with this guy yesterday. But I know that I went where Jesus himself will come. I know there are going to be other conversations with that guy. And I know at some point along the way, he's going to reach where he says, well, I don't believe just because that guy who took me for a coffee when we were in the park. I believe because I've met Jesus for myself. And that's how it works. So, the consequences of our storytelling might not be immediately obvious to us. But you're just part of a bigger picture for people's lives. And that should give us hope. Do you know, if every one of us in the church today was prepared just to do that little thing about sharing who we are, what Jesus has done for us, in a way that's not intimidating, but opens people up. Just think about it. The church would be doubled in size in no time. And, and, and also, please, 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 you know, every time I did a student mission way back, I used to say, before we win some more, let's pray for the ones that were once walking closely with Jesus and are not walking so closely with him now. And okay, I was talking to sort of 20, 21 year olds and every single one of them knew at least one person that had once walked closely with Jesus and was not walking so closely with him now. And I always used to say, do you know, before we rush out to get some more, 
Let's be faithful to the ones that once made that commitment. Because the church is, is, is the only army I know that shoots its wounded. <laughs> Instead of actually rehabilitating people. Well, I love this story, you know, and I, and I love the fact that you're starting this, this um, series. I think you're going to end up being a great bunch of storytellers. And if you don't think you've got much of a story, because somehow it's just all the gloom and doom bits, just have a conversation with Jesus. Because he can take those gloomy, doomy bits and turn them into something that, once healed, can actually make a difference to other people's lives. I want to pray for you. <clears throat> I want to pray for you as individuals, but I also, I also want to pray for higher place. I, 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 love, I love the higher place. I love, I love Paul and Debbie. I love the way they think. You've only got to look on the pull-up banners around here to see the way they think. This is a place where we're not just making followers of Jesus, we're making leaders for Jesus. That's the way Jesus works. Everyone who became a follower of him, he ultimately made into a leader for him. Look at what it says, acceptance, assimilation and action. Now those three steps are so important. And we're asking you to do some action, we're asking you to share a few stories, but we're saying only on the basis of the fact that you've been accepted and assimilated. We're not pushing you out there as people that are not loved and cared for and supported. And then just think about what it says on this one too, because I've, I've read them all while we were here again. Creating people to Jesus. But look at that. Life-giving relationships and God-given destinies. The young man I spent a couple of hours with yesterday didn't know where he's going in life. Didn't even know what his name was. Gave me various versions of names. <laughs> I'll try this one. Just so obviously didn't know who he was. And he's probably not going to find out who he really is until he's had that real encounter with Jesus. But I know that when he has that encounter with Jesus, it won't be just a life-giving relationship. He'll find a God-given destiny as well. Father, we just want to thank you. Thank you, Lord, for the privilege of being in this place where there are so many people in this university who are yet to know you. We thank you, Lord, for the privilege of being in this city, which is probably just about as mixed up as Samaria was all those years ago. But we want to thank you, Lord, that you've got many people in this city, some with very mixed up stories, that could be changed by our story. And Lord, we just pray now for all the grace and all the wisdom and all the insight. Lord, I do believe we've got content in our lives to share. But Lord, give us the confidence to share it. And Lord, release us from that heavy burden that feels that if we don't seal the deal in 10 minutes, we've not been a good evangelist. Lord, we want this city changed. We want this city full of missionaries for Jesus. We want every one of us who knows you to become a missionary for Jesus in this city in which we live and in this nation in which we live and in this world in which we live because we know, Lord, that he that's in us is greater than he who's in the world and the light shines in darkness and the darkness does not overcome it. Lord, continue to work in our hearts and our lives and continue to work through the higher place too. In Jesus' name.